Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy and other Egan Community Television programming is supported by Thomson Reuters, makers of Westlaw Next and based in Egan. Through Westlaw Next and other innovative online services, Thomson Reuters is the world's leading source of intelligent information for businesses and professionals. Online at ThomsonReuters.com and by U.S. Federal Credit Union the member-owned financial institution offering service, value, and experience you can trust to the greater Twin Cities community. Alan Miller with you. Access to Democracy returns, and we have a return guest, many, many visits return guest. And I have to say that probably not only in the 17, 18 years that I live in Mon Minnesota, but probably during my life, there are maybe a half dozen or more people who have made an impression on me uh, just an incredible impression on me. Oh, Alan, one stop. Of them, that's, that's very complimentary. One, <laughs> one of them is Paul Anderson, who's retired from our Supreme Court two years ago, has been a, a frequent guest. And, and I have to say that uh, the time spent with him has been a great educational and learning experience. And he's just an outstanding human being. And uh, just recently back from China on his fourth trip. So I got a line for you. Yeah. After you say something like that, I think Kennedy said it after the missile crisis. Now's the time to go to Ford's Theater when you are so complimentary, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I like that tie that you're wearing, and I understand it's a recent purchase. Yes, I got China. this at the Silk Market in uh, China. Now, uh, on the sixth floor, the better stuff is at the higher floors. But, uh, you know, I think I paid uh, $12 for it. It's a very nice tie. I wore it in, mm -hmm. on a show. So I was in China in uh, May. You know, uh, it's interesting you say about the higher floors. In Japan also, uh, for instance, the geisha houses, uh, the higher up you go, the more personalized treatment you get. Well, that's... Uh, uh, and when I was... <laughs> when I, I had was no knowledge there, of that. Well, <laughs> when I was what, there in the 80s, I was but, astounded. But what I will say is that uh, the silk market is famous for getting low-cost, rip-off items. But it is so popular a place for people to go. And it has good quality items. But you notice that more and more of the quality shops are... Uh, even some name brand shops. And you go up to the upper floors... Uh, you, uh, if you know the right stores, you're going to pay a little bit more. It's still quite a bit less than what you pay here, but you get some really nice quality stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's becoming a more sophisticated shopping venue. I understand that the Macy's has some good closeout prices on Donald Trump ties. but uh, Well, I wouldn't wear a Donald Trump tie. Good, good. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. <coughs> So, let's talk briefly, before we talk about your most recent China trip, briefly about the capital restoration, because you're so involved in that, and it has been, to some degree, so controversial politically, uh, especially with the Senate office building and all. Well, uh, first of we? all, understand, we have <laughs> one of the absolute treasures as far as the state capital. It is recognized as one of the top three or four state capitals in the country. Well, the architect was Cass Gilbert. Cass Gilbert. It was built at the turn of the century at a time states were kind of competing with each other. The turn of the last century. It's the last century, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's 109 years since dedication. But it, uh, and it's not the biggest, it's not the fanciest some of the way, but the quality and the proportionality and the structure just makes it special. 
and but it was starting to deteriorate and falling down. Now you talk about controversy. I've had the same situation I personally. Know. Hey, I've. <laughs> That's when I retired from the court. I realized how I neglected my house, and I needed. Since I've left the court, I replaced the windows, replaced the roof, and because uh, you know. But you were doing this personally. Yeah, well, some of it. Yeah. But the thing is, is buildings deteriorate over time, and the state capitol had been neglected for a long period of time, and its uses had changed over the time. And I'm, I'm very. I mean, it's a political issue, Let's the, the Senate office building. To restore the Capitol correctly and to make it the people's house, as Cass Gilward designed it to be. And as it should be. Right. You had to get the senators out of it. And you had to have a place to go. And now they're talking, well, let's put them down in the old Macy's store and whatever. No. Is that uh, it's long overdue that they have the Senate office building it's not ostentatious. I don't know if you know, I served on the as chair of the design build committee that chose the architect and the builders. We were very aware that Senate office building is going to be a legacy building, but it wasn't going to be ostentatious. It was going to fit the needs. But once that building was decided to go ahead on, then we could properly restore the Capitol. There's going to be much more public space in the Capitol. And it's going to be more accessible. Uh, we're going to have it much more uh, accessible for students who come. It's actually going to be a place where they can meet for their senators and representatives instead of having to do it on the hallway and the stairway. So it's and there's going to be some public reception rooms. My main role right now is chair of a, a co-chair of a subcommittee dealing with what art remains in the Capitol. The infrastructure restoration is ongoing. We're getting a report pretty soon about the art that's on the walls. But <clears throat> we're about a year away from completion. Uh, probably the uh, grand opening dedication will be in the mid year 2017. It's going to be open for the session in January 2017. A lot of decisions have to be made. <clears throat> Uh, because a lot of people don't realize the Capitol was really built and uh, as a memorial to our country's greatest generation. Of course, our country's greatest generation when the building was built was the Civil War. And so, I mean, there's hardly any battle that America or the Minnesota troops didn't fight in that you don't have a big picture on the wall. I can see them sitting around and deciding what art goes in. Well, we've got to have, you know, Nashville. We've got to have, uh, you know, Little Rock. I well, know of the third Minnesota. Yeah. And, uh, and so, but a lot has changed. You know, Minnesota population is more diverse. I mean, there's very little that uh, it depicts women, persons of color. And of course, when the capital was built, the prevailing view among the uh, white male establishment was that the Native American population was going to disappear. See, this is a little known thing is that in 1860, you could identify in the census as category Native American or Indian. In 1900, that category disappeared. Why did it disappear? Because you were never going to, uh, the Indian population was going to be assimilated and would disappear. Well, it hasn't, fortunately, but it's been depicted as a, in a way that's, oh, I should it's, I say. It's, it's been persecuted. Yeah. It's been lied to. It's yeah. been the recipient of uh, trust agreements that were broken. Uh, it's been relegated to third world status, but it is a but vibrant... a painting that depicts that treaty that you say <laughs> incorporates all of those things was f painted by a world famous artist, Francis Millette, who was the artistic director at the Chicago Exposition of 1893, invented spray painting so it could be the white city and he was last seen helping women and children get into lifeboats as the Titanic sank. Ah, it's interesting. 
Uh, but I'm glad, before we leave this topic, I'm glad you mentioned it because we are trying to make as broad an outreach to the people of Minnesota to what their thoughts is, to what the art in the capital should represent. Because the people love that building and it's their building and we want to get their input. And if people want to give their input, who should they contact? We have a website and uh, it's going to be soliciting responses. Uh, traditional means of, you know, say, okay, we're going to get input, we're going to hold public hearings. That's, we will. But that's not the way people communicate these days. No, it isn't. We're going to have social <laughs> media. We're going to have access so people can see what we're doing and respond to what we're doing and give us ideas. Okay. So look for our website, Capital Registration. I don't have the... Uh, Restoration. Yeah, but look up Minnesota State Capital Restoration. You'll find yeah. a website, and we're <coughs> getting geared up on that. Now, you've been four trips to China mm -hmm. where you lecture... Uh, law schools and courts uh, talk about our system of justice and you were telling me that you also sat as a judge in moot court proceedings? Yes, uh, well, the law school, Beijing Foreign Studies University Law School where I was at, sponsors an international moot court every May. So they have teams from China, Taiwan, uh, Australia, Canada, United States, and so they asked me to serve as one of their judges. So I was sitting with uh, law professors from Australia and uh, top intellectual property judges in China. Very interesting thing is that uh, don't ever mistake it, China is an autocratic country. They are ruled from the top. They are very controlled. But in certain areas, and they're allowing certain development and the law is developing an intellectual property because China's becoming a world player not only that it's taking or stealing or however you want to describe it you know ideas and patents from other countries it's developing its own intellectual property that it wants to have protected so the judges I was sitting with are very sophisticated on how the law plays out and whatever now, uh, if you go up on uh, another track in the criminal area, especially if you're dealing with uh, political crimes or crimes deemed to be contrary to the direction that the Communist Party wants to go, no, it's very arbitrary, very capricious, and uh, the rule of well, law... You don't not. remake it overnight, and the fact of the matter is the younger generation probably has a more widely world view uh, of which ultimately they're going to pass on as the older generation is either... You got it exactly, Alan. I mean, the students I'm teaching who are, you know, uh, 20 to 25, 26, I talk to them about the rule of law, I talked about liberty, I talked about individual sovereignty. They get it. I, I mean, I don't have to explain what I mean. When I was there in 208, I needed to explain it more and dealing with the concept, they get it. But they go outside of the crucible, the envelope of the law school, they're limited. It's a different world. So uh, in, the, in the law school itself and in the academic setting, they have more freedom to express and exchange ideas. But in the broader community, you've got to still be very careful. Well, China has made such an impact commercially on the world. Uh, two things I wanted to ask you about. Number one, they're building unbelievably, but they're building cities that seem to be sitting empty. And the question is, is there financial bubble bursting? Uh, what's going on there? Now, Very relevant question. The stock uh, market has taken a terrible in hit In the last there. 10 days, the mar stock market has tumbled. Now, when I was in China, everybody was talking about when was the bubble going to burst. Uh, you know, our, uh, the Great uh, Recession was a lot tied to real estate. Same way in China. Inflated values of real estate. It's surprising an excessive amount of debt that people are incurring, whatever, and they're just wondering and waiting when is the uh, 
the bubble going to burst? Uh, there's thoughts that it started to burst already. You noticed how uh, there was a hesitation by the government, whether they come in and st staunch the bleeding in the markets. They decided to come in. Still, it's going down. Uh, so there's going to have to be a readjustment at some point because uh, people are, you know, it's been a traditional way to beat interest rate or whatever. You buy property, it goes up, and it's a good investment. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, and now it's going to, I mean, the other which thing, is, though. Which is where we were in 2008. Yeah. I got to tell you one other thing, though, is that most everybody lives in an apartment. We were uh, fortunate to be invited and stayed overnight at the apartment of uh, one of my law students who's coming here to the University of Minnesota. Nice apartment, uh, three bedroom, whatever. But uh, the dean of the law school, we had him over to dinner at our house. He saw our backyard, single family dwelling, which is- You're talking uh, about here. Yeah, is in the reach of the middle class. And he just says, Paul, I could never get that here. I mean, I said, do you realize what you have? I mean, the, uh, the environment around you, you have space, a garden, and I mean, he's a upper echelon person and uh, whatever. He said, I cannot aspire to that because it's just not available here. So we need to reflect and see how fortunate we are. I mean, I, I noticed that. I mean, I, a person I'm working with who is, uh, you know, in the trades, okay, he decently paid, whatever, aspires to having a lake cabin, just not available in China. You don't have that because so many people. You have your apartment and that's it. Yep. Yeah. And some public spaces. <clears throat> so we are very fortunate, but uh, uh, I, I worry more about Russia as a power that we need to immediately be concerned about than I do China. There's some interesting literature that's available now uh, about warning us about Russia and warning us that uh, if a World War III is possible, it's not going to come from China. It's going to be because of Russia, particularly uh, in a rational, irrational individual like Putin. And uh, speaking of irrational individuals. Uh, has Justice Scalia gone round the bend? What do you mean about around the bend? I mean, has he really regressed? Is he, he seems to be so well, I, I wouldn't say he's regressed. Is he becoming intemperate? He's very intemperate and he's partisan. Is he, is he sounding he's like he's vindictive? Is he sounding like he's auditioning for a commentator's position at Fox News? I yes, I not. think he yes. is. I, <laughs> you do. Uh, I mean, uh, I've been there. I've been on a court. I've dissented. I've disagreed with the majority. And I find him intemperate. It's uh, showing a streak of ego that is unhealthy, uh, grabbing attention. I mean, and, and he's, I mean, on the, on the Affordable Care Act case, I mean, I was talking to somebody and he said, well, he said, it's likely going to be 5463, but I'm, what I'm waiting for is to read Scalia's dissent. People are starting to anticipate this intemperance, this uh, off the wall. He, he actually denigrated the, the Chief Justice, uh, John Roberts, uh, who is a solid conservative, but who has made a couple of important decisions in terms of the health and welfare of this country. That's an interesting thing. I mean, I was cautious with respect to Roberts ever since he came on the court. I've had some problems with the uh, Citizens United case, but he gets it. He understands how the court works and how you can disagree and temper it. I thought his dissent in the gay marriage case was well articulated and I mean and and by the way he had a legitimate point he said celebrate your victory but I just don't see that this issue is within the penumbra of the Constitution and that's why I dissent. Scalia goes off the deep end and uh, 
and I and also Alito. I Alito mean, even more so in yeah. some degree. And I think the intemperance that is shown is disparaging and diminishes the institution. The Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, has been going down in the public's estimation. I think that the recent cases have kind of maybe stabilized it. It but is I think viewed that, as much more partisan than yeah. it ever was. But the the nature of Scalia's I'm, I, I've met Scalia. I've edited a book that he's done with Brian Garner, whatever. So I, I know what, nice person, friendly, whatever, but <clears throat> intemperate and is, uh, I think, hurting the institution of the court by trying to attract attention to himself. It's like, I mean, maybe he's been there too long. I don't know. Is that uh, he's enjoying the uh, attention he gets from being an outlier and just plays to that attention. That's, you were I over, mean, I, maybe you, I could say. You were over 20 years on the Minnesota Supreme Court. 19, Nobody, 21 as an appellate judge. But. No one would ever say that of you. Your decisions, even if they disagreed with them, were rational and they were well thought out and they were backed up. And yes, uh, there is a little bit of your evolving personal philosophy there, but you didn't denigrate the other members of the court. You or didn't disparage them. And I've never seen that in, in any decision of the One Minnesota Supreme Court. One of the things that's fun, court. I mean, is that and I would have exchanges, is that <clears throat> if I said something that came across a little too sharp, a little too, my colleagues would come in and talk to me. I have, I mean, and I had a great exchange for, with uh, Justice Stringer right before he left. It was dealing with Native American law. And I had thought he used, uh, my first draft said he used dramatic language. And I went back and I thought he accelerated his language and it was a little harsh. And so I dropped dramatic and said is he's using a harsh, inflated language. Stringer comes in and he said, you know, I don't think my language is that harsh and that inflated. But if you do, Paul, I'll modify it and go back. And then I said that Stringer, I said, yeah, but then you would like me to use the word dramatic again because it allows you to quote Shakespeare, Hamlet, <laughs> you know. And he says, yeah, probably. And so I said, okay, uh, you tone down, I'll tone down, I'll use dramatic. That's the way courts work. I mean, it's, and uh, because... But not the U.S. Supreme Court well, anymore. Yeah. There was an article in 1994 mm. about, even going back to then, this... Scalia, and it said how even Scalia can cause a mild-mannered person like Harry Blackman to use, you know, hyperbole and inflated language. That's the danger. If you have someone who does that, then it can cause the language by other justices to Being a provocateur is yeah. what it's being. And, and so, no, I, uh, I'm very disappointed in the, not, I mean, he's got a right to dissent. I'm disappointed in his language and uh, uh, inflated, uh, and it doesn't serve the institution. Now, you have left the Supreme Court two years ago. Uh, Justice Page is going to leave the court in two months. Uh, End of just August. Justice yeah. Wright has been nominated for the federal courts. Uh, do you see this turnover as as really affecting the tenor of the court? It and always affects the tenor of the court. Now, now the, the real question is, does it affect the court? Does it change the court? Absolutely. Is it bad or is it good? I mean, I was quoted in the paper recently saying for everything there is a season, you know? You have new judges come on, they develop, you're going to lose some experience immediately, but they're going to gain experience and whatever. I will, I am going to address the page leaving the court. Uh, one of the real privileges in my life, and it is indeed a privilege, is to serve with someone who is as classy a person as Alan Page. And uh, it was such a comfort to me. 
I mean, I'm a 72-year-old white guy who grew up on a farm uh, just west of the cities, okay? Alan is African-American, grew up in Canton, Ohio. We had different experiences, different life experiences. But as we're trying to be fair and equitable and we're trying to get the right result, I can't tell you how important and how much a comforter it was. I could reach out and say, okay, that's where Alan is, okay? And now we're okay. We're, I mean, and, and he would help inform and the nuance on the uh, decisions. And, and I'm going to, I don't know as I've said this publicly before, you know, we all, we're all human, okay? We're all, we got some biases in us and we, you know, we tend to affiliate and attach to the people who are like whatever. If you serve like I did with Alan Page, you realize how ridiculous racial bias is. I mean, I mean, no question, Alan Page is an African-American gentleman, jurist, and he said, one of the classiest people that I have met in my life. So, I but mean... But you've developed relationships uh, with other members of the court, and I can't believe that we're down to two minutes already. But, uh, for instance, you have a terrific relationship with Justice Strauss. Oh, yeah, he's who's been here, uh, thanks he's to you. He's more conservative than I am. And he's more conservative, but you have a really a wonderful personal relationship. Uh, which developing as do I now, who have had the okay. Now I'm going to tell you why. Alan Page and Justice Strauss come at solutions differently, and they often reach <laughs> different. One more liberal, one more uh, one more liberal, one more conservative. But I will tell you, and this is good advice to your listeners too. They're objective. They start from the same basis of facts. They come to different opinions to see justice being done in their eyes. The danger are those who cherry pick their own facts to soar, uh, support their own ideas or their own uh, uh, preconceived opinions. This is true in life. <coughs> I enjoy people who come to different conclusions and will think differently as long as they start from the same objective base. What I find so disappointing is more and more people are choosing their facts <coughs> to uh, support their opinions. As and Justice Alito did in the gay rights decision. Well, it could be uh, said that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I won't say that. I, I know you, Justice you Alito. Won't, you it, won't say too much because we only have a half a minute well, left for you to I, say it. Your, your, your opinion has some empirical data to support it because some of the questions that Justice Alito asked would imply that he is coming from a particular point of view. And I'll leave it at that. Our viewers in watching this show can readily see why this man has made such an impact on my life. Justice Paul Anderson, an outstanding human being. And thank you again. Always a pleasure, Alan. Always a pleasure. We didn't get covered all no. of the things we need, did we? No, we got we to gotta do it again. Yes. I'm going to keep doing it until we get, <laughs> get it <laughs> right. Until we get it right. Yeah, but the mics are down. <laughs>